Um, so we're going to move on now. Um, our next talk uh, is about endocarditis and uh, uh, the transesophageal echo findings. Uh, this will be given by uh, Dr. Wendy Tsang. Um, Dr. Tsang is a cardiologist and a clinician investigator here at Toronto General Hospital, and she is head of the uh, Complex Valve Clinic. She is also an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Tsang completed her medical degree at Queen's University um, in Canada and went on to study um, her adult cardiology fellowship at the University of Toronto. She then completed a, a CIHR funded a multimodality cardiac imaging research fellowship at the University of Chicago under um, Dr. Roberta Lang. Um, during that time, she obtained a master's degree in health studies. She's published extensively on 3D echocardiography, and she was a member of the writing groups for both the 2012 ASA, uh, ASE and EACVI 3D guidelines and the 2015 uh, chamber quantification guidelines. She serves on the editorial board of the Journal of um, the American Society of Echocardiography, and she's a member of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of, of Canada's um, Area of Focused Competency Subcommittee in Adult Echocardiography. She currently holds a Heart and Stroke uh, Foundation of Canada National New Investigator Award. Her research focuses on 3D echocardiography, artificial intelligence in echocardiography, and valvular heart disease. Um, so, Dr. Sang, um, please uh, let us know what, um, what what you can tell us about endocarditis. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk on TEE evaluation of endocarditis. Uh, can you advance my slide, please? I hear my disclosures. Can you advance the slide? So, by the end of this talk, I hope that you'll be able to describe common complications of infective endocarditis. And my talk is focused on in, uh, infective endocarditis. And then I'm going to ask you to identify, or you should be able to identify on T these uh, findings of endocarditis as well as its complications. Next slide, please. I've attached uh, some references for you, the 2020 ACCHA valve guidelines, as well as the 2023 ESE guidelines for endocarditis and the uh, 2023 revised uh, criteria for infective endocarditis from the Duke uh, criteria. All right. So the um, Duke criteria are the main criteria that we use to diagnose infective endocarditis. And it breaks down into definite endocarditis, possible endocarditis, and rejected endocarditis. Now, the criteria were modified in 2023 to refine the definition, as well as to include newer imaging modalities such as CT and PET scanning. In the next few slides, I've included um, the sort of uh, definitions for you. What's in bold is the revisions to the guidelines to highlight them. And definite endocarditis, the pathologic criteria has been changed to be more specific. And the pathologic criteria are microorganisms identified in the context of clinical signs of active endocarditis or active endocarditis identified in or on a vegetation. And these have to be from cardiac tissue, explanted prostheses, or sewing rings, or from an ascending aortic graph with common committant evidence of valve involvement, from a implanted or intravascular cardiac electronic device, or an anterior embolus. The uh, definite endocarditis clinical criteria have not changed, nor has those for a possible endocarditis. For rejected endocarditis, they did add in one new uh, criteria, the lack of recurrence despite antibiotic therapy for less than four days. Next slide, please. Here, I've included the major and minor criteria. Again, in bold are the changes to the criteria. I'm not going to go into detail on the minor criteria um, because they, uh, and I'm going to focus in on the major criteria, especially on the major imaging criteria. For the minor imaging criteria, it's just the addition of PET scanning. Can we go to the next slide, please? So to remind everyone, the major imaging criteria are now echocardiography or cardiac commuted tomography imaging showing vegetation, valvular leaflet perforation, valvular leaflet aneurysm, abscess, pseudoaneurysm, or intracardiac fistula. There is also or a, a second criteria could be significant new valvular regurgitation on echocardiography as compared to previous imaging. And you have to remember that worsening or changing of pre-existing regurgitation is not sufficient to meet this criteria. And it could be new 
partial dehiscence of prostatic valve as compared to previous imaging. And then the final new the actual new criteria uh, is positron emission computer tomography uh, showing that. Next slide, please. So transthoracic echocardiography remains the first line of imaging for all patients with infected possible or suspected infected endocarditis. Now we've got to remember that on transthoracic echocardiography, the image resolution is about three to four millimeters. So for native valves or valves that have not been operated upon, the sensitivity for detecting a valvular vegetation is about 50 to 90% in studies. The specificity is actually quite good at more than 90%. But when you have prosthetic heart valves, the sensitivity actually decreases to about 36 to 69%. Transthoracic echocardiography, you have to remember, cannot definitively exclude vegetation or paravalvular complications such as abscesses. But it's important because it can actually make the diagnosis, direct early treatment, and identify very high-risk patients who have infective endocarditis. It also serves to assess for valve gradients and regurgitation. It can assess ventricular function and size of chambers, and it can also estimate uh, pulmonary pressures. In particular, for prostatic heart valves in the aortic position, it's, it's very valuable for assessing the anterior aortic area as that can be shadowed on transesophageal echocardiogram. Now, if you look at the two transthoracic images below, I have an apical three-chamber view as well as a zoomed in. And you can see this patient has actually baseline calcification. You can see there's mitral annular calcification. And then on that posterior mitral valve leaflet, you get the hint that there's a mobile mass that's flickering out. And you can see it better on the rightmost image. Next slide, please. So now we go to the TEE of the same patient. And you can see that there is a sort of a heterogeneously dense mass with intimate mobility with not quite a lot of, not a lot of mitral regurgitation. So TEE is very useful for detection of valvular masses. The resolution on TEE is about one to two millimeters, so much better than that of transthoracic echocardiography. And this is reflected in the increased sensitivity and specificity. For native valve infective endocarditis, the sensitivity for detecting a mass is about between 90 to 100%. For prosthetic heart valves, once again, it is not as good. It's between, a sensitivity is between 86 to 94 percent, and the specificity is between 88 to 100 percent. Oh, 100 percent. Okay, next slide, please. So TEE is, um, TEE is um, very useful, but it complements um, transthoracic echocardiography. It is also helpful for looking, identifying and getting better sense of the number and location of vegetations, as well as looking at paravalvular complications, both hemodynamic from regurgitation, as well as anatomical due to um, uh, abscess formation. If you look at these images, these are all transesophageal images, looking at a patient with a bioprosthetic aortic valve. And you can see on the top left corner is a thickening and calcification of this bioprosthetic leaflet, as well, and in the transgastric view, you can see anterior, uh, Posteriorly, there is a, a mobile mass in the LVOT. On the top right, you can see, once again, we are in a, um, a long axis view of this bioprosthetic valve, and you can see that posterior mass flickering. One of the things you have to realize with TEE is that often these masses may not be in our traditional views, and you, can, you have to use off-axis or rotated views to actually identify and not miss these. The bottom row images are the corresponding images with color to show that there is regurgitation coming from this, these valves. Next slide, please. So what do the guidelines say about when do we do TEE? So as I've mentioned before, transthoracic echocardiogram is the first line imaging, but you do have to go to transesophageal for a couple of reasons. So in patients with suspected infective endocarditis, if the transthoracic echocardiogram is non-diagnostic, you have a 1A indication for doing TEE. If you think the patient's gonna have complications or they have intracardiac leads present, then there's a 1A indication of transesophageal echocardiograms. For patients with diagnosed infective endocarditis, if there's they have a change in the signs or symptoms, you may want to have a better look at it. If they are a patient with a high risk of complication due to the type of bug they have, if they have staph, enterococci or fungal infections, then you want to maybe do a transesophageal echocardiogram. 
Now, there is also a new indication if you have stable effective endocarditis being considered to change in oral antibiotics, then that's a 1A indication. And this comes from the POET trial where they transferred people from IV antibiotics after 10 days to oral antibiotics. And so they all had to have a TEE within one to three days of changing to ensure that there was stability of their infection. For all patients undergoing valve surgery for infective endocarditis, it is a one class one indication for intraoperative TE. And this is because infective endocarditis can be a prolonged course and a fluctuating course. And there may be changes from their diagnostic study to their intraop study. And so it's important in order to make sure that all the abnormalities are identified. Staph aureus without a known source or the presence of a prosthetic heart valve with persistent fever without bacteremia or new murmur is considered a 2A indication for transesophageal echocardiogram. And then nosocomial staph aureus bacteremia with a known portal is now a lower indication as 2B for transesophageal echocardiogram. I want to remind everyone that staph aureus bacteremia, about 30% of these patients will have infective endocarditis. Next slide, please. So what, how do we know what we're looking at is a vegetation? Well, vegetations tend to be oscillating masses that are, have some independent mobility. You have to make sure that these masses don't have an alternative anatomic explanation. Okay, so if you know they had a cord that was flailing before, it does not become a vegetation. They usually involve the valve or prosthetic device, the support structures, and they're in the path of jets or shunts. They're usually at sites of endocardial damage or pressure differential. They form generally on the low pressure side for native valves. So for the mitral and tricuspid valves, they'll be on the atrial side. For, uh, for the aortic and pulmonary valves, they tend to be on the ventricular side. They can also form where there are shunts if there's ASDs or VSDs. And right-sided vegetations tend to be much larger than left-sided lesions, as well as um, uh, yeast and fungal infections tend to be larger than bacterial lesions. If you look on the bottom two images, that is a tricuspid valve uh, that's in a low esophageal view. It's almost like a reverse four. We see the coronary sinus, so we have both the posterior and the septal leaflets. And you can see there's a vegetation that is highly mobile on that uh, posterior leaflet with a flail. And then on the septal leaflet, you can see that there is a less mobile lesion. And then there's a big um, atrial uh, septal defect. And there's significant uh, tricuspid regurgitation here. Next slide, please. Now, vegetations tend to be lobulated to amorphous. They tend not to be focal or filamentous or linear in appearance. They can be multiple of them at the same time. They're usually associated with regurgitation or, power, or can be associated with paravalvular complications. The tissue density or grayscale is usually similar to that of myocardium, though with increasing chronicity, they become um, a healed vegetation, they become more dense in appearance. So here's a transesophageal echocardiogram. Once again, you see a large vegetation on that aortic valve, and then there's two smaller ones on both the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the slide is just to emphasize the point. You'll see on some reports that no vegetation seen, no signal of regurgitation excludes um, infective endocarditis. That is not true. The lack of regurgitation does not exclude infective endocarditis. What it means is that you don't have valve destruction at that point. Next slide, please. Here's a example of a uh, repaired mitral valve with a large vegetation on the attached sort of to the base of that posterior leaflet or annulus. And you see there isn't a lot of regurgitation with this. Next slide, please. Now, there are a lot of mimics uh, to what a vegetation can look like. I've actually included some slides from the mitral valve, not everything, it's not extensive, but you've got an example of what advanced rheumatic disease looks like, typical rheumatic disease in the, um, in the second from the right, uh, left, and then a Lieben Sachs infective endocarditis on that aortic valve, and it has a very much appearance similar to what we would normally call an uh, infected vegetation, and then a pseudotumor on the far on the first image from the right. And so other differentials you have to think of for when you see masses are heel vegetations as well as fibrin if you're looking at an intracardiac device. And so you, the clinical context is very important and the location are, are also very important for determining what it is. And then your degree of suspicion for whether or not this is infective endocarditis or not, or if this is circumstances that would be there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
one of the things about 3D is I would not have rely on it heavily just to make your diagnosis because small vegetations may be missed because of low frame rate. With the low frame rate, you won't get the fast oscillating motion of it. And so you won't be able to find them or see them. May just may look like a lump there, um, or they may not have that independent mobility. Here is a TEE from the left atrial perspective of a mass on the uh, mitral annulus with the vegetation going out of it at the tip. And you can see it oscillating there in the cavity. And you can see that the frame rate here, it goes from seven on the left and 15. And you can see that that fine mobility in the middle um, that's wiggling is better seen with the image on the right than on the left. Next slide, please. Whenever you have a vegetation on one, leaf, uh, one valve, you always have to look at all the other valves. And one of the ways these vegetation spread is by the direction of the jet. So if you look at the top left image, you can see that there are multiple vegetations on both the non as well as the uh, left coronary cusp of the aortic valve. And on the bottom left image, you can see we're sweeping a little bit through, but there are two vegetations, both on the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets. And when you put the color, um, color on over the aortic valve, you can see that that jet is coming down and hitting that anterior mitral valve leaflet. And this is how it's seeded that mitral valve leaflet and then spread to that other valve. So remember, when you see a big vegetation, look at where the jets are going and then examine that area because there could be a vegetation there. Next slide, please. This is another example of following the jet. So this is a leaflet perforation. There's actually two perforations here. Uh, if you look at the top left image, you can see there's a perforation clearly in the base of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And how you know this is that there is a uh, the leaflet should be continuous and there is a discontinuous um, region. So um, what probably happened was there was an aneurysm formation and then eventual perforation through there. You can also see on that uh, coronary cusp that is located posteriorly, there is a discontinuous region again. You can see that it comes off the annulus and then it goes to the tip and there's a drop out there and that you can see color is going through both of these. Okay. Now I find that Perforations at the base of leaflets are actually very easy to diagnose. You can also biplane and see the round circular orifice of that. However, when they're more at the tip of the leaflets or in the commissures, we can sometimes mistake and flail for perforations, and that's not what we what is actually going on there. And those become much tougher. When you have a jet that's going straight up like that um, on the right image, you can see in the mitral valve going into the left atrium, there aren't a lot of things that can do that besides perforation. However, when they're more at the tips, they tend to be more... Um, uh, per, uh, parallel or perpendicular, to, uh, sorry, a more parallel to the valve um, annulus. And so then it's really hard to say, is this just flail leaflets and how we're cutting through or not? And 3D does not really help in those situations in the commissures or at the tips of the leaflets, but it does actually help you with the basal leaflet. Um, if you look at the bottom row of images, I've actually got some still frames there showing the vegetation on the aortic valve, as well as the layering on the mitral valve, and then the uh, perforation through that mitral valve. And on the right, I've got a better image showing that jet being directed directly anteriorly towards that basal um, mitral valve leaflet uh, before the, um, during the cardiac cycle. Next slide, next slide, please. You also, when you see um, vegetations, you also follow them along, sweep along and actually see if they extend here. So this is an extension. This is a bioprosthetic mitral valve that's actually infected. You can see that there's vegetation um, covering the entire leaflet on both sides. And you can see that it's going across the annulus and now up the wall of the atrium there. So you want to make sure that you're looking for extension into these, um, into these, uh, into the annular areas, because this is where abscesses will form. Next slide, please. So here's a few more examples from three different patients here. And you've got to look for subtle changes. So if you look at the leftmost image, there's a vegetation on that uh, non-coronary cusp at the tip, and you can see that it's flailing back and forth. But if you look at the commissure between the right coronary cusp and the left coronary cusp, you can see that there is thickening right there. And so that is actually um, early abscess formation. And you can see also that the wall is thickened there. So for sometimes these are not very obvious and they're very subtle. You can. This is also why sometimes you have to repeat the TEE 
early on, you may not see some of the changes and CRLTs are sometimes helpful to actually see these changes. If you look at the middlemost image, this is a patient who had a mechanical bental. There is a vegetation on the mechanical leaflet. If you can look down, it's on that, um, that posterior leaflet. And then if you look at that posterior annulus, you can see it's thickened. Okay, and this is early abscess formation here. And then if you look at the image on the uh, uh, on the right side here, you can see there's a space. There's a, uh, once again, there's a replaced uh, aortic valve, and then there's a space right posterior to that valve. And you can see that there's abscess formation there. Now, the last two images of uh, the, the aortic valve, these would be shadowed on transthoracic imaging. So this is where the uh, posterior annulus, being able to see it very clearly on TE is very helpful. You want to remember, you need to know what normal looks like and what normal for that patient looks like if they've had a prior surgery. And you're looking for uh, thickening or spaces where there should not be any. Next slide, please. So when you're doing it, sweep manually. So this is a patient where, this is our normal view. If we take it, we said there's a little bit of aortic regurgitation. We're good. Next slide, please. And then here, if you uh, clock your probe a little bit, you start seeing there's a mass on the aortic valve with significant regurgitation. And you clock even further, you can see that there's an actual abscess formation assessed to that. Next slide, please. Now you can use um, the multiplane or x-plane modes on your on your with your um, TE probe to try and improve it if you're struggling a little bit with the imaging. Um, you do have to be cautious with frame rate. So again, if you're looking for vegetation, smaller ones can be missed. But if you're looking for spaces or abnormal thickening, it can actually be very helpful because you can sweep here. As you can see, we go from the aortic valve up to the sinuses and then into the ascending aorta. And we're looking here um, and we're looking live as we sweep across, looking for thickening or spaces that shouldn't be there. Next slide, please. So when, uh, this is a nice example of a patient who actually was treated for infective endocarditis and was offered surgery but declined. And so um, we did serial studies because she had wanted a organ transplant. And so they wanted to see what was happening with the valve. And you can see um, how the value of serial studies in this patient, even despite her antibiotic treatment. So you can see there's a uh, native valve with calcifications and there is vegetation on that um, on that mitral valve leaflet with a mobile mass. And you can see there's not a lot of mitral regurgitation. And you see a month later, there's a little bit more thickening and extension up to the annulus. And then about a year later, she's actually created a cavity there. There's an expansion and cavitation uh, from that infection. But once again, she did not develop significant amount of mitral regurgitation. Next slide, please. Now we've shown you some jets um, to, that uh, demonstrate how uh, uh, val uh, secondary valves can be um, can be involved, but you can also get ex ex um, secondary valve involvement by abscess formation. So the top uh, 3D image is just to show you the orientation and how close all the valves are and how abscess formation can infect another valve. If you look at the bottom left image, you can see there's a large vegetation on the septal leaflet of tricuspid valve. And when you biplane it, you can see it's very close to this aortic valve. And then on the right image, you've actually got a short axis of the um, bioprosthetic aortic valve with an abscess and a jet going down into this tricuspid valve. And this is how it's seated, the tricuspid valve. Next slide, please. Now, prosthetic heart valves and intracardiac devices are actually quite challenging for imaging, especially with TEE, because you can get artifact from acoustic shadowing that limits vegetation, uh, visualization. The post-op anatomy can vary. And prosthetic heart valve intracardiacs can involve the frame, struts, and leaflets. And the other thing you have to remember is in prosthetic valve intracarditis, you can have the paravalvular space involved without leaflet involvement. So you may have perfectly functioning valve, but an abscess formation. Next slide, please. Uh, again, once you have pr uh, prosthesis or artificial materials in, you can get shadowing. Here you can see the um, aortic valve anterior um, annulus is not very well seen. And then here we also have mechanical mitral valve, and so the LV is actually not well seen either. So you can't really assess that subventricular on the mid-esophageal views, but for the uh, mitral valve, you would have to use a transgastric view. Next slide, please. Prosthetic heart valves, typically leaflets are impacted first, and then they extend out to the annulus. And Again, you may not have regurgitation, but you may have someone who develops increased gradients. So besides thrombosis, you have to be concerned that they've developed infective endocarditis. So a low degree, uh, a low threshold for suspicious for infective endocarditis is necessary. And here you can see the vegetation extends out to the annulus. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
For prosthetic heart valves, usually the discs are not involved here. The annulus is impacted first. And um, they're more likely to have prosthetic uh, paravalvular extension. Now, I've shown some for mitral, but aortic paravalvular ex um, extension is actually more common than mitral valve. Next slide, please. And in this patient, there's actually a dehiscence of the valve and rocking. This is rocking. There's an actual a lack of uh, co um, uh, connection to the annulus here. And sometimes people confuse um, instabil instability with rocking. Um, just make sure that they haven't reconstructed the annulus because sometimes that can appear to be rocking when it's just a reconstructed uh, pericardial rather than a true disconnection. And if you look at the bottom left, you can see that there's the disconnection uh, between the annulus and the valve and a big jet. Next slide, please. Surgical details are important. Um, this is a patient who had infective endocarditis and had a root reconstruction with the valve replacement. And you need to understand what the anatomy is in order to understand what's happening to here. And if you look posteriorly, you see there's that big space, and that's a pseudoaneurysm. And a pseudoaneurysm, infected pseudoaneurysm, is actually drainage of a paravalvular abscess into the adjacent cardiac chamber. And then if you look um, posteriorly or about six o'clock, you can see there's a jet and that's a fistula. And it's an abnormal communication between two neighboring cavities. Uh, cavities. So this is a aorta to LV communication through a paravalvular leak. Next slide, please. Due to the lower sensitivity of TE to detect pr uh, prostatic valve infected endocarditis, comparison to prior TE images is important. This is a, a more egregious example where we can see the immediate post-op showing a nice normal mitral valve, uh, bioprostatic mitral valve, and then the infection here. And this is where your post-op images are very important. Often we are opening them up, looking at the post uh, images to, uh, before we scan them to see what the valve looks like, because sometimes it's hard to see if it's a suture or if it's a vegetation that's happened or is growing there. Next slide, please. So this is actually a repaired valve, and on the left is the actual intra-op post images showing the nice uh, repair. You can see all the sutures along the ring. On the right, you can see this patient came back with a stroke and was found to have vegetations on his mitral valve. And if you look at about uh, six, seven o'clock, you can see that there are little vegetations coming out from underneath uh, the ring there. And so there were vegetations that were grown. And this is once again, it demonstrates how important it is to compare these post-op images to make sure we are truly identifying vegetations. Next slide, please. Um, this is a pa patient with a pacemaker lead. So not just prostatic valves, but any intracardiac or intravascular device can become infected. And here we see the right atrial lead going into the right atrial appendage, and there's a large vegetation on it. But remember, you should also make sure that there's other associated things are not uh, present. And here is a small ASD with shunting, and this makes this more of an emergency to take care of this because of the concerns of embolization, although the flow right now is predominantly demonstrated to be left to right. Next slide, please. So when we talk about device-related endocarditis, we also have to think about, once again, indwelling catheters, left atrial uh, appendage occluders, septal uh, device closure devices, and other structures. Uh, when you're imaging them, you've got to make sure, especially for leads, that you see the entire lead throughout the path, and it's nice and clean. Um, this is actually uh, a nice case where the pacemaker lead actually went across the interatrial septum and goes into the LV, and you can clearly see how clean this lead is uh, going across there. And then remember, your transgastric cues are very helpful for looking at the ventricular side of the leads. And here we go, that same lead is in the LV cavity on a transgastric views. Next slide, please. And this is a reminder saying that any device or prosthesis can become infected. Here, if you look at the LV cavity, there's a vegetation on this Corolla device. So this was a device implanted in Israel for, to help with diastolic heart failure. And the patient came back with fevers and there was clearly a vegetation seen on it and it had to be taken out in the operating room. Next slide, please. So in summary, TEE improves valve visualization because of improved res uh, resolution, but clinical context is really needed for diagnosis. I want to emphasize again that lack of regurgitation does not exclude significant infection. Complications are related to where the jet is going to or in infection extension. And serial studies, even TEE, may be required. For repaired or replaced valves, comparison to images obtained immediately post-op can be very helpful for us to actually identify abnormalities, and any implanted device can become infected. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you very much, Dr. Sang.